We'll, we'll start in another minute or so. That's fine. Uh, okay. We've got plenty of time. It's nice to not have to talk for a few minutes. So anyway, so that's fine. Dad, is that your real window? It's beautiful outside your house. Um. Yeah, I'm on a deck. Yeah. I it is. I, it's raining here, so I hope the sound is okay. Good afternoon, everybody. The COVID-19 pandemic is an unprecedented event in our lifetimes. And the extent to which it has permeated our everyday lives obligates us to live out the everyday ethics of contagion. Uh, we, we've heard some of that a few weeks back from John Barry, who had studied um, the influenza epidemic of 1918. Um, but th today, it's, it's a great honor to introduce an old colleague of mine. Um, we go back a number of years, uh, Larry Gostin. Uh, Larry Gostin is the university professor, which is at Georgetown, the highest academic rank. And he holds the founding O'Neill chair in global health law. Professor Gaustin directs the World Health Organization Center on National and Global Health Law and is also professor at Georgetown and professor of public health at Johns Hopkins. The WHO Director General appointed Larry Gaustin to this high level position, including appointing him to expert panels on international health regulations and mental health. Larry served on the Director General's Advisory Committee on Reforming WHO, as well as on the WHO Expert Advisory Committee on Pandemic Influenza, Smallpox, Genomic Sequencing, and Migrant Health. Professor Gostin holds international professorial appointments, uh, including those at Oxford University, the University of Witwatersand, in South Africa and Melbourne University. He holds honorary degrees from the State University of New York, Cardiff University, Sydney University, and the Royal Institute of Public Health. Uh, Larry is the legal and global health editor of, of the Journal of the American Medical Association. Uh, Larry is also an elected lifetime member of the National Academy of Medicine and currently serves on the Academy's Global Health Board. The National Academy, the American Public Health Association, and the New York Bar Association all have awarded Larry Galston their Distinguished Lifetime Achievement Awards. In 2016, President Obama appointed Professor Galston to the President's National Cancer Advisory Board. Professor Galston has written many books on health law, human rights and global health, principles of mental health law, and others. Professor Gostin's book, Global Health Law, from Harvard University Press, is read throughout the world and has been translated into many languages, including Chinese and Spanish. The National Consumer Council of the United Kingdom bestowed Professor Gostin with the Rosemary Delbridge Memorial Award the person who, quote, has most influenced parliament and government to act for the welfare of society, end quote. 
Today, Professor Gostin will speak to us about the COVID-19 pandemic in a talk entitled Public Health, Civil Liberties, and Equity in the Age of COVID-19. I am so delighted to introduce you to the distinguished Professor Larry Gostin. Larry, welcome. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, as you've said, you know, you and I go back so many years, uh, so many stories to tell. Um, but I, I guess, you know, in, in neither of our lifetimes have we ever uh, faced anything quite like this. No. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's quite remarkable for all of us. Um, as I'll be saying in my talk, you know, we're kind of all in it together, but we're in it together inequitably. <laughs> And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so um, really what I wanna do is um, uh, take us back uh, to uh, the very first days of the pandemic and, 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 and what's happened with the pandemic and then move on to um, uh, examining how we can think about uh, the pandemic from the perspective um, of uh, civil liberties, equity, justice, and human rights. Um, but I think we want to start um, probably in early December of 2019. Um, and the, 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 the scenario that I'm going to give to you is one that um, most of us in global public health think is the most likely um, origins. Um, but I should say, that, you know, as we speak now, there's a joint WHO-China uh, delegation that's um, charged with looking into the origins of uh, uh, COVID-19. Uh, as I've been saying to the media quite a bit, uh, the the chances that we'll ever really understand the origins are negligible because it's like going back to the scene of a crime 10 months later when the crime scene's been scrubbed and trying to figure out who did it. I don't think we'll ever quite know. But to, be, to the best of our understanding, um, sometime in early December, there was a zoonotic leap um, from a bat to an intermediary animal, um, to a human being. Uh, and although there was um, uh, quite opaque reporting from China to the World Health Organization, nonetheless, um, the uh, event um, seemed to be uh, the beginning of the spread of a highly transmittable um, respiratory virus um, which we now, uh, which is now known as SARS-CoV-2 um, or SARS-2. Um, that, you know, tiny microscopic virus, um, which uh, nobody can see, um, quickly spread um, through uh, Wuhan um, and then wider Hubei province and then throughout mainland China, uh, then to East Asia, uh, and on to Europe and then the Americas. And now uh, it's marching throughout the world um, from the Middle East to Sub-Saharan Africa um, and Latin America. Uh, so in a matter of literally weeks and certainly months, um, this tiny virus gripped us all um, in ways that we never thought possible. Uh, it's really astounding to think how much could control it's had over our lives. Um, Mark and I were talking about, um, you know, our, you know, the you know, past epidemics and things like that. Uh, well, when I was um, uh, asked, I was asked by this, the, the US CDC after 9-11 and the anthrax attacks to draft the model state emergency health powers law, which I did. And it's been adopted throughout the United States and used widely during this pandemic, um, as well as internationally in many countries. And I foresaw most of what we're seeing with COVID-19, 
but I couldn't have even dreamed in my wildest imagination um, that the, a city the size of Beijing would be shut down, locked down tight, or New York, uh, London, Paris, um, and of course, uh, the greatest lockdown in the history of the world, um, uh, the entire Indian continent was locked down, or certainly India, um, and uh, including Delhi. At one point in the epidemic, um, there were one quarter of all of humanity in absolute lockdown. That's staggering um, uh, understanding about how much uh, this has gripped all of our lives. Um, so uh, we, we've seen this tiny microscopic virus that's almost a perfect um, uh, biological specimen. Um, it's highly transmissible human to human. It's uh, highly lethal um, and also uh, has compound uh, disease uh, producing effects on multiple organs of the human body, including what's now known as long COVID of a, dis you know, of a, of a longer duration probably due to scarring of the lung tissue. We've seen it linked to dementia and a whole other things. But it's a very wily virus because it, um, it's fatal, but not so fatal that it kills all of its hosts so it can continue to propagate. So it's not like SARS or MERS or Ebola, um, which can quickly peter out because its hosts are killed. The other perfect thing about this virus, if you're looking at it from, a, from the virus's point of view, um, is, is that you know, something over one quarter of all cases of transmission are asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic transmission. And so we don't know who's infected. Um, so all of these things have made this a wily foe, very, very difficult. But on the other hand, we've seen unprecedented um, advancements in science um, to combat this pandemic. Um, literally within the week of the first report from China um, of a novel coronavirus, uh, the uh, Chinese scientists had fully sequenced genetically uh, the human genome of the virus. And uh, widely circulated that genetic code um, throughout the world, um, which really gave us a head start. Um, we've done quite well with therapeutics. Um, you saw that with President Trump in the hospital. Uh, he was uh, on uh, remdesivir um, uh, and also had an experimental monoclonal antibody treatment, which looks um, quite promising. Um, but the most spectacular advances have been in vaccines. Uh, currently worldwide there, and we're, remember we're only 10 months into this pandemic where normally you would, take, you would expect five years, a decade even, to get a vaccine or you wouldn't expect the vaccine at all. Um, think about um, the lack of a vaccine, for example, for um, uh, uh, many diseases um, that we face. Uh, in the world, um, and you know, including SARS and MERS. Um, and so we have 11 vaccines um, in phase three clinical trials in this short 10 months. Um, we have well over 50 in earlier stage human trials, and well over 100 more in pre-stage uh, animal trials at the moment. Uh, and of course, the biggest news um, came out of Pfizer um, this week, um, announcing preliminary data showing a 90% effectiveness um, for uh, uh, preventing uh, 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 the coronavirus disease. Uh, I have to say that the 90% effectiveness rate if the data are validated, 
exceeded my wildest uh, and most optimistic expectations. Um, most of us thought it would be a vaccine that would have 50 to say 70% effectiveness, pretty much on the order of an influenza vaccine. And you know, influenza is still here. But if we're approaching a vaccine efficacy um, nearing measles, which is about 93% efficacy, um, we've been able to eliminate measles in many parts of the world. Not eradicate, but eliminate. Um, and so this is, you know, it's very, very hopeful. Um, there are many problems though with the vaccine. Um, one of them, of course, is that, it, that this particular vaccine requires two doses. Um, and so we're going to have to have uh, data systems um, and follow up um, with millions of people. And if we think about beyond America, billions of people to get them two doses because they won't be immunized until they're fully two doses. It's also a, a deep, deep, deep cold freeze uh, virus uh, vaccine. Uh, it uh, requires minus 90 degrees Celsius um, uh, deep freeze refrigeration, um, which makes it very challenging to get the vaccine, um, particularly to rural areas um, and to poor areas in the United States and globally. Um, we'll also need an enormous vaccine infrastructure of vaccine workers, syringes, um, uh, and, and other injection equipment. Um, we'll need to have safe sites where people can be vaccinated. Um, and we have, a sh we're likely to have a shortage of supply. And these are all just the problems in the United States. You know, globally, the problems are um, considerably um, more daunting. They're more daunting um, for a few obvious reasons and a few that are less obvious. Um, the most obvious reason is, is that in low and middle income countries, um, it'll be very, very difficult to deliver um, cold storage vaccines um, uh, safely and effectively to the entire population. You know, think about you know, a country with the population and size and rural, co rural composition say is India, um, and you'll begin to see what the challenges uh, may be. Um, and there are also a lack of vaccine workers. Um, we've done some studies of vaccine confidence in the United States and globally. And at the moment, vaccine confidence is very low. Um, and so in order to get any kind of herd immunity, we're gonna to have to get at least 70% of our population um, vaccinated and maybe more. Uh, and if there are large pockets of distrust in vaccines, that's gonna be a problem. Although I have to say with a 90% effectiveness rate, many people may make the risk benefit calculation more favorably toward the vaccine. Um, and with uh, President Trump leaving office and uh, much, uh, much more attention to science, less pressure, pressurizing the FDA, um, I think vaccine confidence will be boosted. Um, so we face enormous hurdles. One you know, ethical challenge that I wrote about with colleagues in JAMA um, was whether or not we should use uh, certain priorities in who gets the vaccine first. I think everybody agrees that first priority should go to health workers and then other essential workers. Um, after that, um, many people think that it should be uh, the vulnerable, the elderly, people with pre-existing um, uh, conditions and comorbidities, and that they should get the vaccine um, uh, first. Um, and then after that, um, the question is, who gets priority? And our argument, and I think CDC agrees, um, is one that should favor those who have been uh, socially disadvantaged, including um, racial minorities who've been subjected to major um, 
uh, disproportionate impact from COVID-19. Um, the case hospitalization and death rates among Black Americans in the United States and among um, uh, Native Americans and, and, uh, and Latinx is roughly four times the rate of non-Hispanic Blacks. And so we've recommended you know, some kind of a social disadvantage index um, for priority uh, in the US. So those are all the problems with the vaccine, and, but many of those problems may be solved down the road. Um, solved down the road in, in the sense that um, it's very possible that second or third generation vaccines will be better. Certainly, you know, uh, vaccines like Johnson & Johnson's don't require two dose and they don't require that kind of deep, deep freeze. Um, which will make it much more feasible to get vaccines to more people. And while I'm talking about vaccines, I, I need to talk about global equity and global justice. And the reason I need to do that is because we've seen an unprecedented vaccine nationalism. I've seen vaccine nationalism in the past. We saw it with influenza H1N1. Um, but I've never seen such fierce political battles going on. Um, you know, so just to give you some examples, um, the United States, the UK, Canada, and the European Union um, have pre-purchased hundreds and hundreds of millions of vaccine doses, even before they're approved. Um, for use on their own populations, uh, which means that there's going to be greater scarcity um, for the world. At the same time, the race for the vaccine has been, you know, a Sputnik moment like we've never seen. In fact, um, uh, Vladimir Putin uh, talks about his vaccine as the, as, as the Sputnik vaccine. Um, and so there are fights between China, Russia, India, the United States, about uh, vaccine prominence and 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 uh, who gets who gets bragging rights. Um, you know, even the Chi Chinese vaccine on the very week that uh, Pfizer announced that the U.S. vaccine had had such high effectiveness, um, uh, Brazil. Uh, stopped uh, or halted uh, the Chinese vaccine trial in Brazil for safety reasons. And then it came out um, that those safety reasons seem to have nothing to do with the vaccine itself. And there seems to be an in a battle between uh, uh, the uh, mayor of Sao Paulo and J.R. Bolsonaro, the president of Brazil. At the same time, there are there are fights you know, in India, Mexico, a whole range of other countries. This is not a good dynamic for the globe. Um, there's only one strong equitable initiative and that's COVAX. It's a, a facility that was formed uh, by the WHO, uh, the Gavi Alliance and CEPI. And it's designed uh, to purchase 2 billion doses of vaccines and then equitably distributing them to low-income countries. Most of the world has joined COVAX, um, except um, for Russia and the United States. China uh, recently uh, did join. I do expect and I hope and I've urged the Biden campaign to join COVAX, um, uh, but he hasn't announced that yet, although he will uh, rescind the withdrawal notice uh, uh, for WHO and, 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 and embrace WHO as, as the United States should. It was, I think, in my view, one of the most ruinous presidential decisions in my lifetime to see uh, uh, President Trump uh, announce uh, his intention to withdraw um, from WHO and to put WHO in the middle of a political firing line um, with China on the one hand and the United States on the other. Uh, I think that was unforgivable in the midst of a pandemic. And so, you know, we can see um, this fight between mother nature and our awesome force and human ingenuity. And 
it's off awesome force through science um, playing out in its struggle. Um, my view uh, is, is that we're going to see escalating deaths globally and particularly in the United States uh, throughout the winter and the spring, um, particularly as people move indoors um, and they celebrate um, Thanksgiving, Christmas and other holidays um, that are um, uh, fast approaching. Uh, we've now in the United States uh, reached uh, record levels uh, in both cases, hospitalizations, and in some, and in some instances, deaths. Um, and so we're in a very worrying period. Uh, and the Trump administration has made very clear that it is not going to fight this pandemic. Um, and so uh, the Biden campaign won't be in until January 20th, and we'll have very little room for maneuver. Um, so we've seen this battle between nature and, um, and science, um, but there's another battle going on, and that's a battle based upon um, nationalist populism um, on the one hand and human rights, civil liberties, and the rule of law on the other. Um, and it seems to me that that's also a battle for the soul of America and for the world. Uh, we've seen um, nationalist leaders uh, really uh, try to extend their uh, authority um, and their power um, using COVID as an example. The interesting thing I find is, is that of the five worst performing countries, you know, probably four of them, maybe more, um, are led by populist leaders. Um, so if you think about it, it would be, you know, Brazil, Mexico, um, the United States, uh, the United Kingdom, and India. All five of, you know, fairly strong men, populist, nationalist leaders. Um, it's worried the UN Secretary General enough to actually establish a COVID human rights uh, task force at the UN level. Um, and so the question is, is, you know, going forward, you know, will we abide by the rule of law? Um, will we uh, consider human rights? Um, or will we um, take nationalism into account? Um, the other question is as well whether how we're going to deal with um, questions of equity. I mentioned earlier that the vast disproportionate impact based upon race and color and, um, and, uh, and poverty uh, in the United States. And that's mirrored throughout the world. And even before COVID, um, my view was is that the prevailing narrative um, of, uh, of the world was one of inequality. Uh, people uh, were fed up um, with the idea that you know, the 1% or the 10% got such riches and did so um, very well. Um, and so many others were left behind. And of course, COVID-19 has really reinforced that it, that inequity and, and shown a light on it in very vivid ways. I also don't think it's a coincidence that we've seen uh, the uh, uh, protests on the streets for racial justice and against police violence at the same time as we've seen COVID. Um, I think both of those kinds of racial injustices have become very painful and, um, and intertwined um, in many senses. Um, so what would we do about equity? What should we do about equity? Um, it was, I say, the prevailing narrative even before COVID, but justice is more important now than it ever has been um, with COVID. And what we're seeing is really alarming because you know most people look at the COVID pandemic and they see uh, ever rising cases, hospitalizations, and deaths in our own country and, and globally. 
But the truth is, is, is that that's the least of the, our problems, as bad as those problems are. It's the least of them. Um, because what we're seeing um, is a sharp reversal, a stagnation, and in many cases, a reversal of all of the global health progress we've made uh, since the Millennium Development Goals and now the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, we've seen uh, absolute poverty um, skyrocket. Uh, we've seen hunger skyrocket. Uh, we've seen women, more and more women, forced into child marriages um, because they need income. Um, we've seen more um, partner abuse and child abuse and substance abuse and mental illness than we've ever seen. Uh, we've, we're placing at risk major campaigns where we've made enormous progress like the polio eradication campaign. We're turning backward with AIDS, TB, and malaria. Um, and of course, I could go on and on and on about the devastating impacts of this pandemic, um, which is a combination of an economic hit, a social hit, a racial hit, um, and a health hit. All of them coming combined with one another um, that's having a devastating impact. Now, on, on civil liberties and human rights, you know, we're, we're all aware that, um, uh, that something like 100 countries around the world have uh, constitutions guaranteeing the right to health. The United States does not. Um, and every country in the world, including the United States, is bound by the international treaty agreement on the right to health. Um, although the United States has not joined the International Covenant on Economic, Cultural, and Social Rights, it has um, uh, joined other conventions um, which guarantee the right to health. Um, and so there's the right to health, but there are also rights to, to civil liberties. Um, you know, I do believe, and I've always believed, that um, you know, in, in a health emergency, you need to give some flexibility um, to, to health departments um, to fight it. And I absolutely um, am convinced of that. Um, but at the same time, there are certain principles. There are principles of US constitutional law, but there are principles in what's called the Siracusa principles. Um, those are an international um, document that really interprets international law. I was actually a very, very young man uh, and uh, was very proud to actually have been in Siracusa and um, helped draft those principles when I was young. They're now being revisited. Um, the National Uniform uh, Law Commission is now revisiting my own model law as well. I think it's justified that both domestically and globally, we are revisiting those things. Um, and we're gonna have to really think about, you know, what does it mean to lock down? What are the safeguards against locking down? Should we have such enormous travel restrictions? Should we have, you know, mass quarantines when you go from state to state? There's so many questions that are unanswered um, by this pandemic that um, it does leave you breathless. Um, the WHO does have uh, an inquiry going on uh, into its role and into future um, powers with respect to COVID-19. I suspect and I hope that in the United States, we will also um, have a reckoning and look back and find out what our major problems have been in the JAMA Forum. I, identified seven lessons learned from COVID. Um, these range from you know, leadership um, through to science, um, through to uh, testing, tracing capacity, through to personal protective equipment, um, and then uh, support for international law and international institutions, including 
um, the WHO. And there are many lessons we need to learn and there's going to be a lot of post COVID commissions uh, looking at that much like we did uh, for West Africa, but even more so, of course. Uh, and so uh, where does this leave us? Um, you know, I think we're likely to see uh, COVID um, with us um, and not returning back to normal until the end of 2021 into 2022. Um, COVID will probably still be around, um, but we'll learn to live with it with a combination of vaccines, um, treatments, uh, and um, continued safe uh, public health behavior. Um, now, it may be that the vaccine is just so, so good that we will get herd immunity and we will eliminate COVID, but certainly not what any of us had been anticipating. And we'll just have to re-examine re re that. Um, so what will, you know, when we get back to normal, what will the new normal look like? Um, you know, I'm often asked, and maybe you asked uh, John Barry this when he talked, um, you know, what, what followed the great influenza pandemic of 1918? Um, most people guess that it was World War I but that, was, that would be wrong because World War I was coincident um, with, uh, with, with uh, the pandemic. It was actually the Roaring Twenties. Uh, people are very social. They want to get back. And we may see that again. Um, but we do face some clear choices as humanity. Um, you know, we can either double down on you know, my country first, me first, um, uh, and uh, the, the whole idea of, um, you know, semi-authoritarian rule. Um, or um, we can take a path that's uh, internationalist, globalist, that, that respects human rights, that abides by the rule of law. Um, we can make enormous reforms in our own system in the United States, strengthening our public health infrastructure like CDC and state and local health departments, insulating our prized public health agencies from political interference to the best that we can. Um, and we can do a lot globally, ref reform the WHO, um, give it the funding that it deserves at least double what it has now, um, give it political support, um, give it powers under the international health regulations. And so we have these two paths we can take. We can be inward looking or we can be outward looking. In my view, um, ethics requires us to understand um, that we are on, in this together. But we also have to understand that we're in this inequitably, that some people, suffer much more than others. You know, it's great for us, you know, for me, I'm here on a deck. I've got my tea and my uh, stocked fridge. I can work remotely with a steady income. Um, but for many, that's not possible. For many in the United States and around the world. So one of the first tasks after COVID-19 is one, is a national and global action plan for equity. I think that's extraordinarily important. Um, so with that, you know, and hopefully you'll ponder and think about how we can make a difference in choosing that right path when this pandemic is over. Um, I'll turn it back to Mark and Laney and um, I'll be very happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Larry, for that incredibly broad uh, description and discussion from uh, from the first pandemic of 1918 all the way up till today. So we do have a lot of questions, some coming in through the chat and some coming through in Q&A and just to the audience, either is fine. Uh, the first question is from Eric Gum, who wrote, we've had bats with us for as long as man has been on planet earth. Why did this happen now? Oh, that's, that's kind of an easy, it's a hard one and an easy one. Um, well, um, bats, uh, have um, 
they have an incredible immune system. And so they can harbor uh, a lot of viruses uh, that don't harm them, but would harm others. Um, and we know that, you know, of all uh, emerging diseases and all novel diseases, at least 60% of those are, have zoonotic origins. So it was absolutely predictable. And all of us predicted, I just have a book coming out at Harvard Press on global health security and I predicted it, but I wasn't alone or special. Everybody in my field did. You know, we couldn't tell you when there would be that zoonotic leap. We couldn't exactly tell you which animal it would be. And we couldn't tell you which virus it would be, but we knew it was coming. Uh, and so the next one might not be a, 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 a coronavirus. It might be an influenza virus, a novel influenza virus, or it might be a novel Ebola virus or, or a, some other hemorrhagic virus. So um, we don't know. Um, basically, a lot of this is to biological chance. Um, you know, when there was, when there is a, a zoonotic leap and how the virus might mutate to make it transmissible among humans. And we've seen all kinds of, we've, we've had a lot of close calls. I mean, we saw a novel virus, um, H1N1, which turned out to be highly transmissible, but frankly, not that pathogenic. And we've seen some like H5N1 that were highly pathogenic, but not highly transmissible. And eventually we were gonna see one that was both, and that's COVID-19. Great, the next question comes from Teresa Williamson. What do you think is the risk of prioritizing racial minorities to get the vaccine first, particularly in groups that have historically feared being experimented on? For example, the African-American community. How would you address communicating a strategy that has a priority for socially disadvantaged groups? Very astute question. It's one we've been thinking about quite a lot. Um, no easy answer. I mean, first of all, using racial criteria explicitly does run the risk of being sh shot down by the Supreme Court, which now has a six to three conservative majority. Uh, there, the, the, the Supreme Court's composition now is not friendly uh, to racial classifications um, uh, to, to, to redress past uh, injustices. Um, it's absolutely true that um, uh, racial minority populations often have deep distrust of um, vaccines. Um, and it's in many ways justifiable. I mean, you, you mentioned Tuskegee and, and other um, studies where, we've, where there's been you know, horrible unethical research um, uh, that was experimenting on, on uh, racial minorities. This is, it's unforgivable. We need to build back trust. Um, we need to ex try to work with community leaders. Um, right now, if it were me, I would be starting a you know, COVID-19 vaccine um, health education campaign um, that would be funded from the top and guided by the CDC uh, on health education principles uh, and health literacy principles, um, but also uh, bottom up um, using uh, community leaders, church leaders, civ civic leaders, um, and really listening um, to what the concerns are about uh, in the population about vaccines. We have one question from Ann Jeske, one of our current fellows. Where would you start in strengthening or reimagining public health systems in the United States? Yeah, I mean, I mean most people would say, um, although this wouldn't be the first thing I would say, most people would say we need to have universal health coverage and consistent high quality care uh, with uh, no cost or deductibility for prevention services. Uh, but I think that the bigger problem in the United States, you know, is, as much as I realize that, that lack of access to health care is a big problem, um, the problem is, is, you know, continually weakening our public health agencies. 
um, state, local, tribal health departments, in particular US CDC um, as well. Uh, I think we need to do a lot better at funding those uh, public health entities, including you know, their surveillance, testing, and other capacities, um, and, and you know, principally their capacities for data systems and things like that. Um, many of us were really shocked at the poor performance of CDC. Part of that was um, not CDC's fault um, because of you know, terrible political interference, um, literally not letting them change a word on their website without White House approval. Um, but part of it was just historic neglect and lack of funding for the agency. Um, and so we need to do better going forward. September Williams uh, writes a two-part question. First, what percent of people of African origin in the USA and elsewhere, including Latinx people as well, have been in the vaccine trials? Um, in my community in Oakland, California, people are already saying they're not jumping to get the vaccine. And the second part is, are there variable strains of COVID which are showing up racially geographically? I think about papillomavirus strains and poor representation of strains seen in the black women. Yeah, I mean, to my knowledge, you know, the, you know, the SARS-CoV-2 doesn't mutate quite as much as an influenza virus. It has mutated, but not in the part of the virus that really causes disease. Um, and so, it's thought that the vaccine um, you know, will be stable over time, but we don't know that um, for sure. Um, there's been a lot of uh, concern about the lack of um, um, minority representation in uh, COVID-19 trials. Um, we try, you know, companies have tried their best and FDA is, has encouraged it, but it has been a problem of underrepresentation of these historically discriminated against groups and particularly important because they need the vaccine more than anyone else because of their disproportionate impact from COVID-19. Uh, Preston Reynolds writes, Philip Alston in December 2017 toured the US as UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. His assessment of the US is scathing and actually predicts what we see with poor minorities with COVID-19. How do we expand American understanding of human rights and our failure to honor the human rights conventions the US has joined? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I know, I know Philip and I know that report, it was very scathing, um, deservedly so. Um, you know, I don't think we've, obviously we haven't made any progress since then. In fact, we've slipped back. Um, uh, we can see that with, you know, all the dog whistles, you know, to racial bigots and things like that and the police violence and a whole range of things um, that are really worrying about, you know, racial justice in the United States. I do think that uh, uh, President-elect uh, Biden will lower the tone, um, but I don't think it will eliminate it even under, you know, the wonderful um, presidency of Barack Obama. Um, these, you know, that part of America endured. Um, we're not one, a country that really prizes international human rights. You know, we're more likely to prize constitutional rights, freedom of religion, um, in particular, the Second Amendment, things that not always are friendly to public health. The next question comes from Caroline Knowles. Do you think that pattern of human behavior that are now changing in response to COVID pressures could be more damaging than the virus itself? Um, so that was was the um, the social the social disintegration is more dangerous than. Yeah, I mean, yes, I do think so. I mean, I think the, um, the social uh, uh, disintegration uh, is, you know, could be more enduring than the virus itself. Um, but they're, you know, they're both, they're, both, they're, they're different and they're, they're, they interact, you know, the, the social disintegration, you know, causes surges in virus, in, in transmission, it causes um, disproportionate impact on um, minorities and, and poor people. Um, and so we need both, you know, we need, you know, good public health prevention to bring uh, this biological threat under control, but we need good social policies and good 
um, uh, social togetherness, uh, really, um, to solve this integration problem. But the integration problem only looks like it's going to get worse. I mean, we can just see it in front of our eyes um, with this election, which, you know, still um, there's not, we, we don't see a, the normal, uh, uh, you know, the normal um, way that we want to see it, a, a transition with, um, with compassion, with decency, with understanding and support. Um, quite the reverse. And so I, sur I right now we're in a bad place in America because COVID cases, hospitalizations are surging and social disintegration is surging. Um, there, there is no, uh, there is no um, solution in the near term. Um, this is gonna be a long slog on both counts. I'm going to add in my own question here um, from a pediatrics set of questions, which are, uh, would you consider teachers part of our essential? You talked about healthcare workers, and I assume that includes doctors, nurses, and all the other ancillary staff, but how about teachers? And then as you talked about the need for 70% herd immunity, um, what are we going to do about kids since we really haven't done any testing on the kids? Yeah, right. Um, well, uh, yes, I actually do think of teachers as essential workers. I don't think of the vice president or the president as essential worker, um, but, I do, but I do, I, but I do think teachers are. Um, I've been most perplexed about, you know, how to advise states in relation to school openings um, because, you know, it is a public health risk because, you know, there's particularly with um, older children, um, they do transmit um, the virus quite readily to their parents, grandparents and things, which is a risk. But the benefits of in-class in education are truly um, important. Um, and so I would find a way to make school openings safer. Um, not, it we'll never get to completely safe, but I think we can make it quite safe. And you know there are a lot very inspiring examples of people getting back to normal. You know, um, Denmark, uh, uh, South Korea, uh, uh, with uh, with very um, you know going back to school in bubbles, um, uh, not even wearing masks. There are ways to do this, um, but we just haven't we have just haven't done it in the United States. We haven't prioritized it. Well, I guess I'm, I'm trying to push you on where are you putting them in the priority? We have our healthcare workers, maybe we're going to have our teachers, we're going to have our elderly, we're going to have our minority disadvantaged. Where are the kids coming in this priority list? Well, you know, um, you mean children being vaccinated themselves? You know, I, I'd have to, I don't think there's been a, uh, a representation or at least not, do you know? Is no, the, well, uh, the Pfizer study went down to uh, 16 years old in, in, uh, in September and went down to 12 years old in October, but clearly the numbers are quite small. So no, then it's the only uh, trial to date that's actually yeah. did any pediatric. Yeah, well, that's, you know, as you know, um, you know, children might react differently to a vaccine um, than an adult. And so we should have, we should have been having kids in trials. I don't don't quite know why we haven't, but um, it is a problem. I don't know. Um, you know, I would certainly, to me, um, I place a, an extraordinarily high value in in-person education, um, particularly to redress uh, inequalities um, that kids, you know, fall behind, you know, because there's some really good data to show that, you know, minority and poor kids when they come to class they do just as well as um, richer kids and then in the summer vacations they all fall behind um, and then they come back and we're seeing that on steroids now so whatever it so so to the extent that we needed to vaccinate teachers and possibly students i'm i'm worried and i want to hear from people like you about whether or not you think it's will be safe and effective to vaccinate a young child when they haven't 
been part of the study. So I don't know. It's a conundrum. Uh, no one's here to hear my opinion, so I'm going to keep asking questions from the, the, the line. Uh, Eric Weil asked, should prisoners be higher up on the vaccine priority list given the outbreaks in prisons, or would they likely cause more harm than good because of prior unethical research on prisoners? Well, I, I, I have the privilege of chairing the National Academy of Sciences uh, Committee on Prisoner Research. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, our, our committee suggested that um, you can be too restrictive of prisoner um, research and that sometimes, you know, it's justified. And when it's justified is when prisoners represent a very, very distinct population as they do with COVID. You know, obviously, um, congregate settings are major uh, risks risks of spread. Um, we've seen that, you know, in immigration camps, prisons, nursing homes, and so if you were going to have nursing homes as a high priority, I would absolutely put prisons on the same priority level. The next one comes from Leonard Slade. Even more than the virus and its physical effects, the mental effects it has on people, both those who do and do, do not contract the virus, but um, those who have other ailments that are emergent and fail to go to the hospital because of lockdowns and fear of contracting the virus, and even because we closed down lots of elective surgeries, right? How are we tracking these incidences and what education is available to help these people understand that the illness that their illness is just as critical to get to the hospital as those with the virus? Yeah, well, that's a compound question. And it's kind of the question of our time. Um, you know, f first of all, on, on mental illness, I mean, I think, you know, there is an epidemic of loneliness out there. Um, and that's, you know, not, it's, 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 it's not the virus itself, but it's the reaction to the virus. Um, but as far as, um, not going to hospitals, you know, we're seeing um, spikes in, you know, in, in cancer, uh, heart disease, other, other um, problems. Um, and there was a recently a study uh, in JAMA of excess deaths um, showing that, um, uh, that the excess deaths in the United States and probably lower life expectancy going forward um, are well beyond the actual deaths from COVID itself. And so the intuition that um, the question uh, raises is, is, is correct. Um, it's having a lot of knock-on impacts. And in my work in, in global public health and public health, it's almost never the disease itself that is the biggest killer. It's always other things that, you know, that happened um, with, with Ebola, it happened with SARS, um, and MERS, where just people, you know, don't get the care that they need. And also, they, 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 they suffer from other diseases and deaths um, because of loss of income and things like that. Loneliness, there's a whole, whole configuration. There's a lot of research that we need to do to understand this better and to try to combat it. Um, you, you mentioned the, the harms to the CDC because of the politicization. There are some questions um, from uh, Martin Chen about uh, what about the politicization of the World Health Organization? Um, yeah, well, I've been writing about it. About, I, didn't, I did mention it. Um, no, it's been unforgivable. It's been terrible. Um, imagine in a pandemic, uh, WHO you know, caught in the middle of a geopolitical struggle between China and the United States. And imagine, you know, that in 1948, um, when uh, Truman uh, uh, moved us uh, into the World Health Organization, based upon a joint resolution of Congress, all three branches of government supported it. And when we signed the UN Charter and WHO Constitution in New York City, just, to imagine that we might actually give notice of withdrawal from WHO is truly jaw-dropping. Um, but though that will be, you know, that will be remedied uh, in its formal sense uh, when Biden takes off on January 21st, he'll rescind the notice of withdrawal from WHO. Um, but I think it's going to have long-term consequences. Uh, there's a big trust deficit um, between the international 
health community and the United States. We have one who says, uh, since I started with the kids, what about vaccines for pregnant women? Should, a pregnant, should pregnant women be involved in these clinical trials? Yeah, I mean, pregnant women, it turns out that actually they're, they're at quite elevated risk um, for serious disease from COVID. So they, um, uh, they are in a risk group. Um, and so you've got two factors. You know, one, I, I, I think they're, you know, the risk that they face is probably similar to risks of other high risk populations, you know, like the elderly or people with uh, comorbidities. Um, but at the same time, you face this child problem that I'm not aware that there was, you know, that it was studied well what the impact of the vaccine is with pregnant women in the trials. Um, and this is a constant problem. And we've talked about, we, I mean, you know, you, Lenny, Mark, and I know this, and all of our, all of your fellows do that there's been, you know, long, you know, history of underrepresentation of populations in clinical trials, you know, women, children, pregnant women, prisoners, others. Um, and then you're faced with, well, the, what do I do question? And, you're, and you, you have to make a decision without full information, without even any really good information. Mike Massal, who's a developmental pediatrician here at the University of Chicago, um, I'll take the, the gist of his uh, concern was, can we really have policy arguments without attention to the big disparity that the public loves grandmother's Medicare, but hates poor people, especially children's Medicaid? Yeah. And how are we gonna deal with that with the COVID vaccine? Hallelujah, I mean, I, you know, one of, the, one of my key messages to the Biden team, which they didn't accept, but they should have, is, you know, don't, you know, don't think about, uh, you know, Medicare for all, it's not gonna happen. And don't even focus on lowering the Medicare age to 50. I said, why not have Medicare for children? Zero to 19, it would cost pennies and it would have political support and no one and, and the public health benefits would be enormous. Seems like such a no brainer. The Biden campaign loved the idea, but it's just not been part of the plan in the platform. But that's been one of my, um, uh, one of my beliefs for a long time. We, you know, we really are in America. I mean, if we get in really deep into this, you know, my generation is absolutely robbing the young generation. You know, we're taking all the resources through Social Security and Medicare. We're voting for, you know, things that are in our self-interest. Um, and, you know, it, it's, there is no ethical justification um, for not giving a child high, full and complete and affordable access to health care, including dental care. Eric Weil asks, can you please elaborate about how to try to resolve situations where conflict occurs between respect for a patient's autonomy and public health challenges like pandemics, where health of one person can be impacted by choices made by other people? Similarly, do you see this vaccine possibly being mandated? And if so, for which communities? I think it's unlikely that it will be mandated. It could. I mean, by law, we could mandate it state by state, not federal government. Um, but I don't see that happening. Um, you know, we've, we've, never we've never had an adult mandate in modern history in the United States. The only exception I can think of is the recent uh, Massachusetts decision to mandate adult influenza vaccines. Um, so I don't see that. In terms of how you make those trade-offs, you know, I've always thought um, you ask a series of questions. Um, you know, the question is, is uh, how bad is the problem? It's bad. How likely is the intervention um, to save lives and, and, and to save, save and to cause less disease? Um, are there other less restrictive ways that you could accomplish the same objective? Are you doing it in a proportional manner? And what are you really asking 
the public to do? How onerous is it? You know, it's one thing, you know, to be locked down and, you know, with the, and, and you can't get out. It's quite another to be asked to wear a mask or to stay six feet apart from someone or not join a, a, a political or motorcycle rally. Um, all of these things, you know, seems to me that in most of the kind of conversations we're having, public health should win. Not all of them. Um, we can go too far and we can use public health as a subterfuge. Um, uh, but, I do, but I do think that um, the things that we're asking of the American public um, to protect not just themselves, but others uh, is qu quite critically important. Another priority question comes from Jumana Al-Sheikh, uh, one of our former fellows. What are your thoughts about unblinding vaccine trial participants after an EUA has been issued for the particular vaccine they volunteered in? and pri prioritizing the placebo group to receive a COVID-19 vaccine? Um, you know, I don't have a strong feeling about that. If my instincts would be, I wouldn't necessarily, I wouldn't favor that. Um, you know, I think people enter trials, um, you, know, f you know, for good reasons, um, but I would not, I don't think they get special treatment over other groups. Um, and so the fact that you joined a trial wouldn't lead me to believe that you should then uh, get vaccine priority if you're in the control group over, say, you know, a health worker or a teacher or somebody like that. You have to make hard choices. I'd like to give it to everybody. I'd like to say yes to everything. But you can't. <laughs> Laurie Zola, who's from our Divinity School, asked the question, were there public health dogma that were simply wrong? Like if we could do it again, would we or should we close borders? Oh, well, I mean, there, there were dogmas that were wrong. Um, borders are tough. You know, there was a long article in the Times and the Washington Post that I contributed to. Um, border, you know, basically closing borders uh, can buy you some time. Um, whether or not it actually prevents uh, epidemics, um, most of the evidence is that they don't, except in island nations like New Zealand or Pacific Island. Um, uh, so travel is tough, you know. I mean, basically, my message to the media and the report reporters was that, you know, travel restrictions are a, a, a dogma of public health in the sense that public, global public health has always been against travel restrictions. And there were very good reasons for that, which I can go into, you know, basically, if you look at, at like Ebola um, and uh, when, you, when, you, when you slap on a travel restriction, you punish the country, um, but also you prevent humanitarian assistance from getting to that country. Um, but it's been a long dogma and it's in the international health regulations. Um, but if you would ask me, you know, what do we know about whether travel restrictions work, what kind they work and when they work, I would tell you um, a truthful answer, which is, I don't know. Nobody does know because we've never studied it because it has been a dogma. We need, we need, we're flying blind when we do things like that. In other areas, like, you know, people talk about masks that, that CDC and WHO were very late in, and they changed their guidance on masks, on asymptomatic uh, transmission, on aerosolized transmission. Um, you know, I think uh, most of that is due to evolving science. And I don't necessarily think the scientists got it wrong as much as we're constantly learning and we adjust. Uh, great. Maria Donahue asks, as an advisor, does the transition to a Biden administration include strategic and tactical plans for the next pandemic for who USA globally harmonized plans as a result of this experience, such as expanding division of viral diseases here and abroad, travel monitoring, data collection, as autonomy is a barrier to full response by Americans, what message do you have for effective quarantine? 
Oh yeah, I think so. Um, you know, one of, of the two senior advisors uh, for uh, uh, Biden is Beth Cameron, and she ran the pandemic response group in the White House uh, in the Obama administration. Um, she's also one of the leads of the Global Health Security Index, which I've involved in. Um, yes, absolutely. I think pandemic preparedness should should be and will be front and center. Yeah. Um, uh, Mark, uh, Brian, do you have any other questions? Um, can, can you hear me, Lainey? Yes. I, I was fascinated. Um, I, I was fascinated, Larry, by, by the opening of your talk when, when you spoke about the WHO and China meeting to, to figure out where the origins of the coronavirus uh, pandemic might have been. Um, can you say anything more about the, the options or the possibilities? You mean the, the options for WHO and China or what the options or possibilities are about what probably did happen? About what? <laughs> that, that is to say that, that it originated as you would point yes, out. I think, you know, I think that, the, that, that the conspiracy claim that it originated in the Wuhan laboratory um, oh, oh. There's no, no evidence for that. Um, almost all of us think, all of us really, um, that it was a zoonotic leap. We think it came from a bat because we've seen uh, coronaviruses in bats um, and then it went through some in, in intermediary animal and then, and then um, uh, had a leap into human populations. But we don't know where and when or how that leap took place. Um, you know, whether it was at the Wuhan market, when it was, how it occurred, was it, you know, did, was the animal eaten, was it in close contact? Um, because it's very obvious that when we thought that um, uh, the leap occurred in late December, that that wasn't what, when it happened, um, because uh, there were, there are too many um, community cases of COVID-19 at that time that were not linked to the market. Um, so, it, uh, so, I, so most of us think it was circulating in China um, at least since early December and I've heard even November or earlier. Will we ever get to the bottom of it? No, I mean, I think there was a chance early on, um, there was a joint China WHO um, uh, commission uh, early in the, the pandemic, you know, within several weeks of the origins, um, when we could have had the chance to do it. But the problem is, is that WHO was only allowed by China to send in a skeletal team. Uh, the team was really um, uh, based in Beijing, not in Wuhan. It didn't have uh, uh, access to scientists, whistleblowers and others. I think the access will be greater now um, to those groups, but I do not anticipate any certainty or e even any advancement in our knowledge of that zoonotic leap. And frankly, you know, the truth is, is that when the WHO China report came out um, early in the pandemic, it looked to me like pretty much of a whitewash. I don't think we'll see quite a whitewash now because, you know, China doesn't feel as threatened as it did. It's actually flexing its muscles quite a bit. Um, but I don't think we're gonna to get to the bottom of it. It's most likely some uh, uh, animal reservoir that then um, uh, had an occasion to, to jump to a human. So we're gonna take a final question from Brian Callender, one of our panelists here. Um, go ahead, Brian. Great. Um, yeah, so, you know, sometimes it takes a, a good pandemic to shine a harsh light on public health ethics. And so I'm just interested in what you think the future of public health ethics will look like in light of this pandemic. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's hard to know. Um, uh, we've seen um, 
we've seen a lot of um, uh, uh, lot, lot in the literature on public health ethics and also on equity, but frankly, I haven't seen anything um, that's all that innovative. And you know, in the bioethics community, there still is a a tendency to focus more on traditional biomedical questions, doctor-patient relationship questions, autonomy, respect, and all that. Um, justice is part of it. But I don't, you know, I don't see a leapfrogging in, in our field uh, to have a kind of a full whole embrace um, of public health ethics. It's expanding, no doubt, and it has expanded quite a lot. But I haven't seen any exponential expansion since the pandemic. I don't know, maybe you have, but I haven't. Um, well, I just want to say thank you very much. This was an incredibly stimulating lecture. And uh, as you can tell by the number of questions that you were asked to field. So I just want to say on behalf of everyone, a big thank you. Mark, are there any final words that we need to say about next steps? Um. Well, I, I, think, um, I think the fellows uh, will be asked um, to participate uh, in an informal discussion uh, with, with, um, with Larry Gaston. And um, it would seem to me that um, uh, and anybody uh, remaining in our program uh, might want to just stay on and continue this the informal discussion for, for another 20, 25 minutes. Because I, I know Larry has um, an event that, that he must be to by, by two o'clock, uh, his um, our time. So, uh, so that, that would be my suggestion. Um, uh, only to say that um, uh, our talk next week is by Keith Walu on inequalities unmasked, what pandemics reveal about American society from the Spanish flu to COVID-19. That, that, that should be a very interesting talk. Larry, the talk today was extraordinary. And um, um, should we take a five minute break? And you know, I'm, I'm kind of, um, I've got a dual problem. I mean, one, I'm really exhausted. Oh, um, two, but two, I've got another, um, call that I need to take at um, at uh, two thirty five my time one thirty five your time right um, so maybe could I take like a one minute break and then just do it for ten minutes let let's do that is that okay it, um, it's, you promise, it's more you it was more uh, exhausting than I expected it was a lot of questions Larry if you promise to listen to my question as the first question when you come back in I, one minute. I absolutely promise. Okay, so I'll so do I. I'll just stay on this line and come back in a minute, and then we'll just take a few minutes more with the students. Perfect. Perfect. Thank Perfect. you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, L Lainey, Thank thank you for for running the question period. That was wonderful. So, since you're not changing lines, Mark. Um, how do you want to be addressing the, the, the questions, the, the fellows, unless there's something that, um, I don't know that anybody can get them to ask questions except with the Q&A. Yeah, I, I mean, we, we'll only have uh, 10 minutes to do it. Um, and I, I, think the, I think the fellows, at the moment, I see nothing on chat, is that correct? Uh, well, there has been. I mean, Preston wrote that uh, that she had some of her students from Global Health. Um, so we've had a few. Most have been in the Q and A. Um, I, I would love to have our fellows uh, fe feel free to ask questions um, if if they wish to do so. Uh, otherwise, we'll open it to anybody. Okay. What I'm just trying to say to you is they can't ask the questions. They're going to have to write it. Yeah, yeah. It, it would be good to, to write them right now while before he comes back and when I ask him my, my dreadful question. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm back. 
I, I'm going to start with, with, with a question that doesn't deserve to be asked. But in the face of, of the United States leading the world in, in, in the impact of this pandemic, 4% uh, of the world population and 20% or more of, of the pandemic in, in this country. Um, do you have any sense, living in Washington, D.C., on why the Trump administration did not and will not fight this pandemic in a more aggressive way? Well, Jai, I mean, I think it all, I don't have any, it's no secret. It's the person at the top, it's Trump, you know, he, um, he at the beginning, he appointed, you know, reasonably good people. Um, we had people from CDC, Tony Fauci, others was on the task force. Deborah Birx had, at least at that time, a fairly reasonable reputation. Um, but he undermined them, he, he, he kneecapped them. Um, I just had a conversation yesterday with, you know, the head of the COVID work at CDC and basically was told, you know, uh, many of their guidelines um, were either um, blocked by uh, the White House or they were, um, uh, or they were rewritten, that any word on their website that was changed had to be cleared with the White House. I mean, it just was totally toxic. Um, I can't get inside the head of a man like Trump um, why he would do that, but he's kind of a nationalist populist and he just decided that he was going to rail against science and experts and public health. And it's all the anti-expert stuff that's going around in, you know, that in that, you know, in, 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 in uh, national, nationalistic populism. Um, so, it's been a disaster um, and it's going to just keep going until we get a vaccine, which is a shame. We're going to lose probably at least another hundred thousand lives. One more. The, the next question that, that comes is um, from uh, Chinasa Imo. What would you say could be the contributing factor for why Africa has had low infection fatality rate in light of the fact that early projections showed a different outcome? There are a lot of different theories. Um, uh, one, you know, among the various theories, you know, one, it's got a very young population. Two, that a lot of the, um, the living and the partying and things are outdoors in kind of under, under open air tents. Um, three, that they actually had pandemic experience um, from uh, Ebola and AIDS. Uh, and that they actually performed better um, than in many uh, Western democracies. Those are the three prevailing theories and it's impossible to actually uh, you know, know which one is the most important. And, but they're not through it yet. You know, they might see surges there, we, we don't know. And certainly places like South Africa have been very high. Another one of our fellows just wrote, I just watched a webinar in which the CEO of Rush Medical Center spoke about sharing resources without thought to institutional finances. Rush is a role model for seeking out high risk patients from safety net hospitals and having them transferred. Rush is one of the other academic medical centers here in Chicago. Um, and having them transferred to Rush so they can attain the benefit of Rush's resources. Has there been talk about creating some sort of system in which hospitals become part of a collective, sharing their resources with the government being the payer, at least in pandemic times, so that we can maximize resources and health outcomes? No, it sounds like a very good idea. I'm not aware of any of that. Um, I certainly know that, it, that when Ebola was here during uh, West Africa, um, we quickly pivoted uh, to having um, just a few centers across the United States that d dealt with Ebola cases. I haven't seen that with COVID cases at all. And I haven't seen a lot of sharing. I've seen a lot of competition, <laughs> um, but I haven't seen a lot of sharing. But it is a good idea. It sounds to me a very good idea.
Uh, well, it, it seems like our, our, uh, our questions are, are more or less complete. So well, again, I just want to say that <laughs> you get a five minute break before your next phone call. So thank you very much. And okay, we really you. appreciated it. Thank you very much. Okay, take care. Larry, it was Larry. wonderful to see you. you. It was great to see you, Mark and Lainey. It was um, maybe next time in person. I, I have a lot of good reasons to come to Chicago because my daughter-in-law is from Chicago. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. Anytime you want to come, just let us know. Yeah, well, when the pandemic is over, I'll, yes. I'll be in contact or contact me. <laughs> Take yeah. care. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 Thanks, Lainey. We'll, we'll, we'll gather again at, at uh, 2.55 for the 3 o'clock.